Hello, my name is Samuel George London, and welcome to Comics for the Apocalypse. On today's episode, I speak to comic book creator, letterer, editor, and exceptionally nice person, Ken Reynolds, about what comics he would take into the apocalypse. But before we get into it, if you do enjoy the show today, please leave a review for us on iTunes or whichever podcast service you use, as not only will it let me know that you liked it, but I believe that it helps make other people aware of the show as well. Now, without further ado, on with the show. Hello, Ken Reynolds. Hello. How's it going? I'm good, thanks. You? Yeah, I'm well. Um, have you had a uh, busy year thus far? Yeah, it's been nice and busy. Everyone's got the enthusiasm and vigour about making new things, so I'm helping them make things. Awesome. Always always better to be busy than bored. Oh, yeah, never bored. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, firstly, thank you so much for, for being on Comics for the Apocalypse. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to have you on. Um, and for the listeners that don't know who you are, uh, can you tell us what you're doing in the world of comics? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I wear a few hats, but some people know me as a writer for a supernatural adventure comic called Cognition. So some people know me as an editor for the experimental comics anthology Slice Quarterly. And a lot of other creators know me as a letterer, and I help people with their letters. Excellent. Um, and uh, where can people find out kind of more about your 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 helping services? <laughs> Everything I do is on kenreynolds.co.uk, which is my writing, my lettering, my editing, and everything else, really, all in one place. Fantastic. And then on Twitter, you are? Oh, no. Let me think. <laughs> or am I throwing a curveball? <laughs> yeah, I, I changed it last year, and it hasn't stuck in my head yet. Oh, no. <laughs> I changed it when I changed my website. I think it's... Um, Edit point. It's Reynolds KR20. There you go. At Reynolds KR20. Perfect. Everybody go follow Ken. Um, always a always a laugh, and, and particularly with your uh, my life as as a cartoon. Um, yeah, I started, that's great. Yeah, I started posting those again last year. They're they're actually quite old. <laughs> I did yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. A good five or six years old now, but um, yeah, I started reposting them again, and it's it's yeah, it's just a nice thing and. They get they get the old chuckle every now and again. Oh, totally. And um, I was telling you just before that you you've actually featured on uh, on somebody's list already. Um, you the, the the episode hasn't aired as of yet as we're speaking, but it has aired as this episode is speaking. So right. like by the time that this actually airs, um, you'll you'll know who it is. <laughs> yeah, so I'll track that down. Awesome, fantastic. Well, um, starting off with the first question that everybody's asked on Comics for the Apocalypse, what type of apocalypse would you like to be in, or what type of apocalypse do you think you would survive in? Uh, I'd, I'd be alarmed if anyone would like to be in a specific type of apocalypse. Cause you'd, think, be, you'd be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the notion of wanting to live through it, um, I, I can't really imagine, but I, I'm under no illusions that I will be one of the people that die in the first wave of pretty much any apocalypse because um, I don't run very fast or not particularly strong. Or I might be able to think my way around a few things, but I think it will be any apocalypse I'm likely to survive will probably be more down to luck than judgment or any sort of skill. So I think it's more of a um, once we get to the point of global antibiotic resistance and people just start dying of colds again. Wow. Um, Maybe my immune system, I'll luck out because I, I don't tend to take pills unless I absolutely have to. And uh, my immune system's not too bad, so I might, I might survive that one. Excellent. And so, kind of the the world's gone to pot with uh, with mass global antibiotic resistance, um, and uh, like ninety percent of the population has died out, have they? Yeah, of just sort of colds and like flu and things like that just just really common stuff and kind of how's kind of what does the street look like i just a total, well it'd just be it, it's a sort of 28 days there i don't think much would change you'd probably get a bit of writing and things people getting after the last of the drugs that work 
yeah so it's be a little bit of disarray and things but it'd be a bit 28 days later just eerily quiet i think yeah 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 just without the zombies <laughs> without the zombies yeah i'm, I'm sure i mean there's all the, the weirdos always do survive though, don't they? They do. usually <laughs> if if we if films are to be believed a big proportion of weirdos survive these things unfortunately so yeah. um and and so where where are you going to base yourself in this apocalypse where am i going to base myself Oh, I don't know. See, I, I'm not. I'm not a planner. I, I'm, I'm really not the sort of, or, or not in this way. <laughs> um, I guess I would find. I think underground would be a good move. I'd, I'd like to try and stay hidden. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I used to live in an apartment flat, and we used to have terrible mould. So I think that might just bring flashbacks. Um, <laughs> no, I really don't know. Somewhere safe that you could barricade. I mean, Walking Dead had the perfect solution, getting into a prison, didn't they? Yeah, that's that's a pretty good one. Um, so we're we're going for an abandoned prison. Yeah, I think so. Should we just go for that? Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, so. Let's, let's play on someone else's tropes. Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> if, it, if it if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> um, and so uh, the the group that you've ended up with, um, one one night around the. Uh, the prison fire, <laughs> let's call it. Um, the the subject of comics come up, and the first question that's asked is, "What's the first comic you remember enjoying?" First comic I remember enjoying. Um, it will be a common one because it's probably the Beano, and specifically the Beano annuals. Because I used to get one for Christmas every year. I never used to get sort of the weeklies or anything like that. We never used to do that, but we'd always get a an annual of some sort for Christmas, a book, and they always used to make them. There. I think they still do because now I've got a daughter now, so you notice these right. things in cycles. So from the age of sort of 10 upwards, they disappeared from my life because no one bought me them anymore and I had no reason to go looking for them. But, mm -hmm. but now for a child, I sort of, they've sort of appeared on my radar again as like an easy gift to get a niece or nephew <laughs> <laughs> so they still do them it's just for weird it's for like lego and things like that now is the odd annuals but they always used to do a special beano annual and it's a massive hardback or well, seem massive at the time big hardback and um i don't know thinking back on it, i have no idea if it was just reprints from the year or if it was all original stuff i have no idea whatsoever but my favorite inside that was always the bash street kids yeah, classic. Oh, right, those, yeah. Especially any, any particular characters. Well, ev everyone always remembers Plug, don't they? Because he was sure. the long, gangly, weird-looking guy. But I always liked the guy that had half his face in his shirt. Was that Wilfred? Maybe. Um, Maybe I can't I really remember the names. Yeah. But... I, yeah, neither can I. I sort of remember the appearances. But the, the, the kid that had sort of half of his face in his T-shirt, I like him. Fair enough. And, and what, what was appealing about him? No idea. It was just this weird half-a-head little... Half head is just memorable, I guess. Fair play. Um, I just uh, I remember uh, the pig. Is the pig in the Bash Street Kids? There was a pig. Did they? Ha is that like a school mascot thing? I think. That yeah, is. maybe. I mean, yeah. it's like a pig that kind of used to hang out with them. <laughs> maybe it was one of the one of one of the pets. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I do remember the pig. Like the big guy. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. Anyway, kind of it's uh, it's all all in my memory somewhere. Um, I'm sure somebody can can wiki that. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, um, so so the Beano um, uh, is the first one that you remember enjoying. Um, and uh, talking of things that used to amuse you, the next question that comes up is, uh, what's the funniest or, or comic that made you laugh out loud the most? Probably most recently, it's uh, Giant Days. Right. You know giant days i'm, I'm aware just, of it yeah yeah um i was i came to it quite late um i'm only about three or four volumes into it i think i need to carry on with it but it's it's very much um my sort of humor it's quite um acerbic in places and quite cutting right but the writer manages to make it fun as well which is something that my own humor lacks sometimes sometimes it just lapses over into darkness or just being mean <laughs> sort of lose the fun in it you know and and it manages to keep it quite light but it's it's very um insightful it's very observant and um because it's about three three women in university it's quite um nostalgic in places as well it's not necessarily just about the university experience it's about the formative years of 
that that stage in your life you're sort of figuring out who you are and what you care about and figuring out other people and things like that it's, it's quite universal themes to it and it is just really funny it's quite um pop culture as well there's lots of references to all sorts of different things in it um yeah, it's, yeah. I, I really need to start reading it again. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back on it, and so the setting is it's it's three women at university, right? Yeah. Um, and and are they in? Uh, is this is this uh, British or is it American? It, it is British, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely is British. Um, the main character is from Northampton, I think, and they're going okay. to might be Leeds, might be Leeds. I think it might be set because I think the writer's up from that way. It's John Allison, the writer. And um, I think there's two or three artists now. I think they changed early on. Um, I can't think who it is now. It's terrible. Oh, I always hate not crediting people. I think it's Max Sarin now that does it. And it's lettered by Jim Campbell, who letters everything, because he's really good. Hmm. And, um, yeah, it's just about their, their, their pitfalls and just f finding out about university life. And it's sort of, everything's for comic effect, but it's always got a, basis in um truth like the the old tropes of university students sort of protesting about certain things and making a fuss and making a stand but yeah there's lots of there's lots of humor in looking back at that time even if there wasn't that much in living it <laughs> <laughs> sure i get that uh, that's uh, that's awesome um and uh changing gears the next question that comes up around the prison fire um is what's the saddest or most upsetting comic you read I take issue with whoever asked this one around a campfire in a prison after an apocalypse. Fair um, enough. <laughs> Ask, asking for trouble, really. Because <laughs> I think we're all probably a bit down. But um, I, I think I probably... The, my my re-entrance back into comics was not was down to um, Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean quite a lot. I found um, a college lecturer gave me uh, Arkham Asylum by Dave McKean. Uh, I think he was my photography um, tutor. Right. And he was sort of showing it around as a mixed idea of mixed media because we were playing around with... Um, did, did you ever do photography or anything like that? No, no, I didn't. Classes? But the old-fashioned photography where you used to use negatives and the enlargers and things, you'd sometimes overlap the negatives and make these um weird collages and montages but it's all within the process of developing a photo right so you'd sort of overlap two negatives and you'd get the overlapped image when you developed it and he was using dave mckean as an example of um photographic manipulation techniques and things like this and he passed around arkham asylum and um that eventually led to my choice, which is a book called Signal to Noise, which is Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. And um, it's about a filmmaker who discovers that he's dying. Right. So th there's, your, there's your sadness. <laughs> yeah, straight off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> but the really sad thing is it, it, it's basically about this creative person that is faced with his mortality, and he has to ask himself the question of, um, what he's going to leave behind. So he's got enough time to sort of make one final thing to, to leave his mark. And it's sort of the, the morbid reality of trying to figure out um, what what if, if what you do while you're here sort of outlasts you once you're gone. And I think anyone that makes anything or does anything creative... Um, it's a really morbid thing to to sort of sit around and wonder about. But I think it's an important thing because it um, you sort of start posing the questions like, well, if I'm not scared to if I'm not scared to death that I don't get to do this, should I be doing it in the first place? Sort of those sort of questions. Yeah. And it's advice that you hear a lot is like, why would you bother making something if if you hate the idea of never getting it done before you die sort of thing and um yeah so it's those sort of ponderances isn't it and the artwork is very well dave mckean so it's sort of very dark in places and i think it ends with um four huge splash pages of the four horsemen of the apocalypse or Epic. its interpretation of them mm. and uh yeah it's a really beautiful book but it's very um dark and it's very heavy but um 
Yeah, that one stays with you. <laughs> oh, definitely, it sounds it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, the like the the question of kind of like the saddest or most upsetting. It's it's obviously sad and upsetting, but um, as he kind of said, it's it helps you ask yourself questions, deep and meaningful questions. Um, and I think that's kind of important for us all. And perhaps that's why the person around the the prison fire asked it. Um, however morbid. <laughs> yeah, well, I think. Oh, well, sadness is important, isn't it? I mean, you Very. you need it to sort of as your barometer to figure out all the good stuff, to know when the good stuff's happening. You know, it's very important emotion to well, I wouldn't say embrace, but accept. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think there'd be plenty about at the apocalypse. So we'd definitely. And and that's the odd thing. If 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 your life is full of sadness, then you you oddly enough, it doesn't take very much. The other side. To feel huge you know what i mean yeah. very small things can very small positive things suddenly feel a lot bigger and it's it's a strange balancing act definitely um and so uh going almost in the same vein the same kind of um crazy person <laughs> asks what's the scariest or most horrifying comic so you're in this big scary dark prison around a campfire and they ask what's what's the most do we, do we really need fiction, guys? Do we really need fiction for this? At the exactly. Moment? We're living it, all right? <laughs> I haven't... I, I, I haven't... I um, don't think I've ever been really scared or completely freaked out by a horror comic, but I think that's more down to me not experiencing a wide array of horror comics. Right. Um, I know there's a lot of, like, Japanese... Uh, is it Junji Ito? I know he's, he's spoken about a lot with the sort of the master of, of horror on that side of things and uh it's something i keep meaning to pick up but there's nothing that's really really freaked me out i think it's more um comics i think have a, are a really good medium for like a creeping dread yeah and sort of knowing that something's coming uh, i think horror works best with a soundscape which obviously comics is lacking mm. um but I think the most horrifying comic that I've read is, um, and I've only read it once. <laughs> <I've> only, <laughs> yeah, once. But I, I did a uh, my university dissertation on the comic narrative. Right. I sort of justified it as a narrative form against film and novels and things like this. And one of the comics I chose to do that was Mouse by Art Spiegelman, which is of, which is uh, about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people will know what Mouse is and will have at least heard of it, even if they haven't read of it, but it uses anthropomorphization. Yes. So the Jews are mice and are the German, yeah, the Germans are cats and the Americans are dogs. And uh, it's about him, Art Spiegelman telling his father's story about being a survivor um, in the war, in the Second World War. Yeah. And... Like I said, I've, I've only ever read it once, but there are two or three panels in the book that flash through my mind every time I either think about or hear about this book. And it perfectly encapsulated, encapsulates how powerful comics are and how it involves the reader mm. because the, the panels are just depictions of empty gas chambers and empty furnaces. So, so out of context, <laughs> yeah, but out of context, there's nothing particularly horrific there but within context of the narrative exactly. it's, it's getting the reader to fill in the blanks yeah and that's that, that that's always stayed with me as a very a very powerful way to involve the reader and to just really stamp in the horror i mean obviously there's not a lot of stamping of that particular horror that needs, <laughs> <laughs> needs uh, emphasizing yeah, yeah. but <laughs> so. i thought it was a it was a really clever way of um really hammering home um the point on that one and it's something that has absolutely stayed with me and it, it is hor horrifying to whenever i remember reading those pages definitely um, and uh, kind of move it, moving on on a on a slightly positive, more positive uh, note. Um, the the next question that that comes up is, what's the most meaningful comic to you? Ah, oh, see, this is where my ego comes in. It's all the ones <laughs> on my page. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, 
there's particularly one book at the minute that I make, which is the first time where I do everything on the page. So I'm writing it, drawing it, lettering it, everything. Brilliant. And um, it's most meaningful to me because I'm using life experience to tell the story as well. It's sort of based mm -hmm. on some of my experiences or my, my wife's experiences as well. And uh, yeah, that, that one's really meaningful to me because it's, it's, it's fiction, but it's informed fiction. And um, yeah, that one's, that one's called In Trouble. In Trouble. Out is that out yet? Okay. Um, the first issue is on my website. It's because okay. I published it in 2017, I think it was, the first yeah, issue. Right. I got it, got it done. And I did a little Kickstarter for it and put the first issue out. And then I just, things, I couldn't get back to it. It was quite busy. Mm -hmm. I've um, put it up on my website now and I'm working on the second issue to release it as a webcomic. Great. So I'm going to start it again as a webcomic later this year. But that one's about pregnancy and the end of the world. Right. It's quite apt for here, actually. <laughs> yeah, works very well. <laughs> but the concept is a woman finds out that she's pregnant mm -hmm. on the same day that news breaks that an asteroid will hit the Earth in around the time that she's due to give birth. Right, wow. And it's, um, yeah, it's sort of informed by mine and my wife's experience of pregnancy. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. You've got to ask yourself a lot of questions in that nine-month lead-up to... Yeah it's, hitting, don't it's, you? yeah, it's just a big metaphor for life-changing events, really, and how you process process that and kind of deal with it. Um, that sounds amazing, mate. Um, have, you, have we got an ETA on that? Um, I'm about seven pages into drawing it. <laughs> the second issue is there's, there's sort of 22, 23 pages of it on my website, ready to read, all there. Great. I'm about seven pages into drawing it. The second issue is completely written. I've just got to get back into it. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm, I've got in my mind the first quarter of this year, so I'd hope to have start posting it again by March. Excellent. Yeah, so by the time that this uh, episode goes out, it'll be in about a month's time. So, okay, but we'll um, see. Yeah, now I've got time Ken's website. Now, now I've given it a time scale, I'll probably have to get back on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you've committed, Ken. you got to get on it, mate. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, mate. Um, and then uh, the, the, the conversation uh, moves on to what's the most underrated comic? Uh, underrated is a weird thing, isn't it? Um, I, really, it's any, any number of creators in small press comics that I've got to know over the last three years or so that I think are putting out work that deserve a much wider audience than maybe they're getting at the minute. So, I mean, it is, this, is, this is a position where I'm going to start naming names and tomorrow I'm going to, another name will pop into my head and go, you should just <laughs> it. But it's people like Tom Ward and Luke Parker's Merrick, the Sensation Elephant Man, mm -hmm. they, they yeah. make that through Kickstarter, and that, that I mean, that's turning into an ongoing comic at the minute, just mm -hmm. being funded through Kickstarter. I think they're up to seven or eight issues now over the last three years, which for small press is great. But you know, if, if a publishing house came along and sort of funded them, they'd just be able to crank it out, you know. Um, I've been working a lot with Chris Sides over the last couple of years. His writing is fantastic, and I think deserves a lot more deserves to be read a lot more widely. I've awesome. like I mentioned he's, he's one of the people that I've just finished up lettering, and I'm doing production on his book. He kickstarted a book uh, late last year called Here and There, which is a psychological horror comic, but it's got a huge um, emotional heart to it as well. I think it's going to surprise a lot of people when that when that goes out. Nice. Um, and I've been editing some of his scripts, so I know what what's coming out in the next year or so from him as well. And he's got some really good projects in the pipeline. Uh, and then there's Sarah Millman. Her MP <laughs> series is great. I mean, her art is fantastic. I could see her working on big books, fitting in with big books, you know. Um, Stuart McCune. I, I wish everyone would read one of his books. I think it, it really pushes the boundaries of what a comic is. Brilliant. and um, would really change a lot of people's perception of what a comic is once they'd read one of his. Um, Nick Prolix, I think his art is fantastic. I think, I mean, he, he's, he's got a real European comic sensibility about him, sort of, and his line is so fun and quirky, you know, and sort of free. 
I think I think yeah I, I, yeah and and his his writing on the sheep and the wolves as well shouldn't go unmentioned as well. I mean a lot of people think of him as sort of the artist, but his writing on that is really clever and insightful too. Um, I guess it's just people that are telling stories and doing it in the way that only they can. Mm-hmm. And you can just sort of uh, you can feel the authenticity authenticity of it on the page, you know. And um, yeah, and I think if, if if you're putting if you're managing to get that across in your work, I would hope that an audience, a bigger audience, would find it. Absolutely, um, and uh, I mean, small press in the UK. I mean, I've I've only just really started creating like a year ago um comics um i've only been a fan of comics for <clears throat> maybe just under five years now um and uh it's just mind-boggling the talent that's out there um especially in the in the uk it's it's incredible and uh yeah highly recommend um everybody to uh to go read i think the uh the pipe dream comics uh, top 100 of 2018 was a pretty good list of kind of maybe undiscovered uh, talent out there for people to read as well. Yeah, it's a good starting point. That'd certainly yeah, give you a good starting that'd point. certainly give you plenty to go through and sort of discover. Absolutely, exactly. And then kind of take it from there. And then um, small press day um, is coming up. Is it July or is it June? I, can't I remember. think it's July. I did see that yeah. the other day. They did an Akira homage. They did, didn't they? I saw that. <laughs> that was cool. But uh, yeah, um, I think it's just at Small Press Day on Twitter, isn't it? Um, and kind of just following that is probably um, a good way to kind of discover um, undiscovered talent, I guess. Absolutely. Um, there's there's a few podcasts as well that yes. won't see you too wrong. Um look through the thought bubble um ex- 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 exhibit a list last year there's so many people so many people exhibiting there and that's not to mention the people i know that make comics that i met walking around including you <laughs> as well yeah, exactly ken it was a, a real uh, real pleasure to to finally meet you after all the twitterings and whatnot <laughs> that's that's why i like thought bubble a lot because it is the biggest one nearly yeah. everyone goes to it whether they've got the table or not a lot of people make the effort to go there and it is great to put faces to names and to meet people in person with people that you've been communicating digitally with for Mm. on and off all year. I mean, like I said, I've been working quite a bit with Chris sides and I only met him once in, no twice in person last year. And that was at cons, right? You know, but we work together. We sort of speak every week or so through um, messaging or through Skype or something like that. But Mm. So it's really odd because he it started a couple of thought bubbles ago with Chris. Um, uh, we are we I managed to give him editorial feedback over a drink at the mid con party at Thought Bubble, and I managed to get as much over in ten minutes over a drink as we did sort of messaging back and forth for about a month beforehand, you know. And that there, there yeah, there is something to be said for a simplified and direct communication on that one. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely yeah. if only there was like a i don't know like a small press campus where we could all just <laughs> hang out <laughs> that'd be we like just have a yeah comic camp campus oh john um, Locke did um the small press the comic of, summit the, the comic summit last year yeah i couldn't make that one but i listened to the um to the panels afterwards which are still available i believe so if you google yeah. comic summit um you can download them um brilliant uh, did you go to that again i didn't i i couldn't uh john asked me along but i couldn't get down there but if, if it if it happens again i'm definitely interested to go along definitely uh, yeah that seemed really productive yeah and just it's uh, and i can only imagine that the the sort of meeting up with uh, with other people sort of after <laughs> afterwards mm. would have been fun as well and there would have been just as much useful stuff talked about that wasn't recorded you know absolutely no doubt fantastic um and so we get to the to the crux of the uh of the conversation and uh, and that is for you what is the best comic of all time 
Uh, it's such an unfair question. <laughs> it is unfair, but we're, 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 we're cutting right down the line here. <laughs> it will change every day. If you ask sure. me, it will be different. But for now, it's probably, and it's cheating, but it's all of Sandman. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Um, it is. It goes back to... Um, I guess it goes back to the idea of those gateway comics mm-hmm. and um, convincing people that comics can be more than people expect or have been led to believe they are. Mm-hmm. And I think Sandman is a, is a big one for that. Not perfect because the first volume of it is very comic-y, very traditionally comic-y with sort of introducing characters and crossovers and things like that. Mm-hmm. Once it got enough popularity to get away from those sort of tropes and become its own thing, it really, um, yeah, it, it seemed to take mainstream comics into places that it hadn't necessarily travelled as much. There was always someone I'm sure that have done it before, but it was the, the biggest mainstream successes of what shift, what shift the focus, and. Um, yeah, I've I've only really sat down and read through it in its entirety once, and I do keep meaning to go back, but there's just too much new stuff and good stuff and old stuff that I never knew existed. You know, it's hard to go back and reread sometimes, but it it left a huge impression, and uh, I'm really glad that Vertigo went back to it now. Have, have you read any of the new stuff? I haven't read any of the new stuff. No, I've kind of read all the original stuff, but uh, yeah, I'm the- yet to get around to all that. Yeah, the new stuff, I've started um, reading The Dreaming again. Right. And I've got Lucifer waiting, because I like um, Stan Waters, I think, writing it. I like his stuff. Brilliant. And um, oh, what's the other one? I think there's four books in the Sandman universe that Vertigo are putting out now. Right. And it's, it's quite brave to go back, because uh, as a writer, I can imagine it would be a bit intimidating to visit those, <laughs> revisit those characters. Definitely. Uh, um, it's sort of a yeah. There's certainly it's a fleshed out, varied world that is sort of ripe for revisiting. I think, but the original run and the way it ends is um, it's it's big mythic storytelling. You know, it, it's sort of all the way back to Shakespeare, all the way back to Greek legends, and it, it's almost about the nature of storytelling itself Mm -hmm. and it's just so ambitious it's so yeah i don't (laughs) i don't know anyone that's sort of going for that now you know yeah or is being allowed to go for that yeah exactly because you can have all the ideas in the world but trying to kind of get it out into the world yeah different question isn't it um just kind of depending on market conditions and kind of your own resources and things. But I guess it, it doesn't stop anybody just writing a script, um, kind of putting that out to the world and then seeing if, you know, any collaborators want to get in on it, I guess. No, but I would never I would never tell someone to write 10 volumes of an idea. <laughs> yeah, so that might be asking a bit much, right? That. <laughs> um, and, and asking a bit much, um, the... the, the the last question in regards to comics is uh, which uh, one comic would you take from this list into the apocalypse? Um, yeah, it probably would be all of Sandman. <laughs> sure. It's a, it's a big old load of comics. <laughs> yeah, the big heavy collected library editions. Yes. Right. Trouble is, if, if you're desperate... Uh, that's, that's a lot of paper. Someone's going to eye that up for the fire. So yeah. that would be. I'd have I'd have to defend those, but they're probably heavy enough to use as weapons too. At the same time, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure it'd be very difficult to kind of get bored of of that, wouldn't it? I would like to reread it as well. <laughs> yeah, just again and again and again. Yeah, I keep meaning sure. to reread it. Maybe the apocalypse. I'll have enough time. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> let's uh, let's bring on the uh, global antibiotic resistance apocalypse sooner rather than later, so, that, so that Ken can just right. read Sam. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, and um, what weapon, tool, or useful item 
would you like to take into the apocalypse with you? Uh, duct tape. Bingo. Yeah, can fix anything with duct tape. Absolutely. Sorry. Very useful in, on so many levels. Uh, I can only imagine. I, I didn't want to get too violent with it. I didn't really want to start sure. thinking about weapons. <laughs> because the truth <laughs> yeah. is, like, like I said at the beginning, I'm the guy that's going to get clubbed over the head first. So, <laughs> Well, duct tape can be kind of a good defensive kind of weapon, can't it? I'm just thinking of, you know, kind of when Jackie Chan, like, take somebody's shirt off and kind of uses it to like tie their arms to their body okay and stuff yeah. like that so you can kind of do that with duct tape you can imagine yourself kind of you know um opening up the duct tape to kind of arms width and kind of, you know <laughs> tying somebody's arms like really quickly in what, a jackie chan kind of style <laughs> what you're describing is duct tape nunchucks you realize that bingo amazing <laughs> so there you go you can make nunchucks out of duct tape anything amazing yeah, see, don't tell you anything. Possibilities are Use endless. Up. <laughs> see? Fun. That's a really good choice, mate. Um, and uh, we were... I was actually speaking with Aaron, you wouldn't have heard this yet, uh, but uh, one thing that we should try and do is uh, try and collate everybody's uh, weapon choices <laughs> and try, try, try and get kind of a, a collage of everybody wielding their, their weapons <laughs> or, or useful item, basically. You realise that's just going to be like uh, a shopping list for preppers, don't you? Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, it's going to be a lot of fun, though. I would love to see that on a poster. Um, incredible. Maybe we'll do that one day. Um, but uh, Ken Reynolds, thank you so much for your time today and, uh, and your choices for comics for the apocalypse. Thank you. Excellent. And for, for one last time, where can uh, where can people find you? Yep, uh, my website is kenreynolds.co.uk and on Twitter I'm ReynoldsKR20. Excellent. Um, and then apart from um, In Trouble, it was In Trouble, wasn't it, Ken? Yes, it was. Yes. Um, that, uh, do you have any other projects coming up? Um, later this year I'm hoping to run a Kickstarter campaign to collect all five issues of Cognition into a trade paperback. Excellent. That's definitely on the cards. Uh, by the time this is finished, the third volume of Slice Quarterly hopefully will have been funded and sent out and fulfilled. Excellent. <laughs> That's running as we record. but um, So fingers crossed on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, no, I'm just sort of trying to pick up as much lettering work as I can. And I've been enjoying my the editing work that I've been picking up. Um, this year's sort of me trying to figure out a, what's next a bit. Um, yeah, there, there is, there's, there's ideas for more cognition, but, um, I might try and explore a few other things. So this year's sort of finishing up and then figuring out, which is quite exciting. Definitely. Like the world's your oyster mate. And, uh, yeah, good luck to you. Cheers. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Ken. And, uh, I'll see you soon. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thanks again to Ken for being on comics for the apocalypse. It was a real pleasure. If you enjoyed the show today, please leave a review for us on iTunes or whichever podcast service you use, as not only will it let me know that you liked it, but I believe that it helps make others aware of the show as well. If you'd like to check out Ken's work or follow him on social media, those links are in the show notes, along with all of our own links to the various areas of the internet. And finally, as long as the apocalypse doesn't come to pass in the next week, I'll see you next Monday. Bye for now.